Hey there. Uh, welcome, everybody. My name is Josh Thomas, and this is the How to Lose Money podcast. Uh, Paul couldn't make it today. Uh, he, is, he is off uh, foraging for berries, I think, in the forest, he told me. So we'll kind of see, see where that ends up. But uh, hey, our guest today is Kaylee McMahon, the apartment queen. She's going to tell us how to lose money by poorly flipping a house. Hey, Kaylee, how are you? Hey, good. Uh, getting over a virus, but good now. <laughs> oh, good. Well, you should try some of Paul's berries. I should. <laughs> <laughs> when, whenever he comes back. So Can I get back. some in Austin? I'm headed there in a minute. Yeah. Yeah. You know, we'll just come by. We'll do the exchange. Um, hold your hand out as you're driving by and I'll just kind of like throw them at you. Chuck it in the window. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. So really great to have you on here. Uh, and we're going to get into your story here in a second. Um, it's, it's a very, uh, unfortunately, a common story, one that we've heard many, many times. Uh, and uh, it, it never gets old, you know, there's, there's never an end to the lessons that we can learn from it. But could you just kind of give us a taste about uh, what is this story about in a couple of words, uh, just before we get into it too heavily? Sure, the story is just about, um, I guess, to summarize it at the end, the lessons that I learned when trying to be mentored to do something that you want to do, and kind of being aware of your source of mentorship and being able to vet that person or people um, correctly to be able to get to the results that you really want to get to. That's great. I have a, I have a lot to say about that. So we'll yeah. go through your story and then we'll probably have a little back and forth here at the end because uh, there, there are a lot of mentors out there, gurus, uh, coaches, however you want to call them. Um, and most of them are full of crap. <laughs> you know, we can't, can't really do anything about that. But uh, the, the best thing that you can do is kind of spot the signs. And we'll go through that into your story. So hey, for everybody uh, on here on the podcast, thanks for being here. Uh, let's talk a little bit about our guest. Kaylee has purchased more than $2 million in real estate as key principal. Uh, she has sold over $3 million in residential real estate before transitioning into cur current full-time syndication role. Originally from Portland, Oregon, Kaylee, Kaylee is a co-host on the KVGI radio, The Drive. Uh, she has started a podcast called The Number One Leading Ladies, uh, where she interviews kick-ass women who are disrupting their industry and the real story of how they got where they are. So the entire backbone of what gets Kaylee out of bed every day is her why. This is something that she'll share when asked personally about it. But at a 30,000 foot view, it is to create independence and space for those experiencing codependency and toxic relationships, which hamper their ability to visualize and then manifest what their amazing reality truly could be. Her company, Culture, models this why and is changing the face of multifamily to bring more women into the light as powerhouse operators, key principals, and commercial brokers. Wow, that's powerful. Tell me a little bit more about that, Kaylee. Um, that's everything. <laughs> that's literally my everything. Like I actually haven't read the book, Start With Why, but I understand the concept. I mean, I honestly feel like in life, I was really lost until about two years ago when I realized what my why was. And then it took, and I'm still not done learning, obviously, uh, and growing, but it took until kind of seeing what was going to get me to that path as fast as possible to make a difference in other people's lives. And I've learned through a lot of struggles that I'm still going through now. Um, and at the end of the day, hopefully they turn out in a way that makes a large uh, difference in the way the legal system is and the way that um, abuse is handled and whatnot. But, you know, for now I'm just dealing with that. And all I can do is focus on every day, learning more, progressing more and being able to um, accomplish things that at least, for example, show, you know, high school women, college women, or even women that are even older than me sometimes, you know, that you really can do it. So that really is what, what is everything to me. You know, I want other people to grow like I have. That's awesome. And, and I get the sense that we're not exclusively talking about entrepreneurship or business in this situation. You said toxic relationships and codependency, and that has a lot to do with kind of the personal side. Yeah which is really everything. I mean, people act like work and personal is separate. It really isn't. I mean, as far as, you know, for me, dating people, 
I work with, a different deal. That's a separate, those are separate things. But as far as having feelings and being mad or being happy or feeling uh, whatever way you feel, I mean, you work all week long, you know what I mean? So your reality or your life is your work. And so kind of, it's all the same thing, if you will. So it's important to, you know, be, be healthy across the board. Yeah. Well said. I couldn't agree with you more on that. So we can talk about that a little bit more in a minute, but let's kind of get into this story here, shall we? Yeah. Okay. okay. So, um, Start us off. Uh, green, green flag. Everything looks good. Uh, how did you, how did you find yourself uh, marching forward towards this opportunity? Yeah. So um, pretty much marching forward towards the opportunity was me being in real estate already. And so I had access to a lot of uh, MLS data or tax data to be able to find what would be a good value of a home to flip. So knowing as a, a realtor and now broker at the time, how to run comps and kind of figure out, you know, what your spread would be between what you can sell it for, what you're buying it at, what the renovations will cost. Uh, that was a part of education that I dug in and taught myself but at the time, um, I, like I said, found somebody who had done a lot of it and had done a lot of it for a lot of years. And so far, again, I'll come back to this lesson later, but so far it seemed like there had been no, no hiccups, no problems, and they were just flipping a lot of real estate and making some good money, sometimes assigning things and making fees there as well. So it looked good from the outside. So I thought, okay, well, if I'm going to find a house to flip, it's going to be in an area where someone has already done it and done it a lot. So they understand the market. They understand, you know, what's too much of an upgrade for that market. Because one thing now in property management with apartments is that you can run numbers all day long. But if you have someone that already owns an apartment or a house or a asset in that area, and you can look at their books and you can like really see what they're doing, I mean, you literally can't find any more reliable data than that. So it's like, what, what are you guys actually spending? What are you actually netting in your pocket? Not what you're writing off and what the tax records are showing or whatever. But anyway, so I felt comfortable after the information that I could find to find a good value of a home to then find someone that was doing a lot of uh, home flips to resell in this community. And, um, you know, now looking back, there were a lot of... Um, <clears throat> The, our personalities are very different, you know, and so this has been a big lesson as far as partnering with people moving forward in multifamily because, you know, in a single family, I feel like you do a lot by yourself. In multifamily, it's a team sport. And so it's even more of a, a magnitude of being able to be aware of who you're doing business with because you're going to be in bed with these people for four or five years, sometimes longer. You know, they're your partners, they're your um, family, if you will, I guess, in this situation, uh, financially. So um, in this situation, I kind of went off of somebody's word, you know, and again, I wasn't able to hurt a lot of people because it was my cash and it was my loan. And it was, you know, a, a house that I purchased. I thought it was literally foolproof because I bought something that was like $20,000. I mean, it was nothing, uh, but it was a complete burnout and a meth house and it needed everything, literally every system possible. And I go, Oh yeah, no one else wants to, to touch it because it's such a pain in the butt. I'll do it. You know, I'll, I, I'll walk down the walls. I'll do whatever it takes because I am a hard worker which is the truth. But then literally day by day, as we go on, I'm learning, okay, I can't literally do the demo myself. Like this is a, an old house that has uh, like everything in this house, as far as behind the actual walls is solid. Um, everything that was, um, that wasn't termite eaten and that wasn't burnt out and that wasn't rotted because of wood rot and, and water. <laughs> um, this is, um, uh, anyway, it, it was, it was solid wood. Wow. So it needed to be, yeah, I mean, sounds up. like, sounds like a winner. <laughs> yeah. So I need to, but it was a small house. So I was like, how yeah. hard can it be? But, um, it's a lot of work. So, uh, so the person that I was kind of modeling myself after the first warning sign I should have saw was, okay, there's a female that's working alone in a house for the most part doing this stuff. And I'd walk around with like a gun in my boot and lock the back door and make sure that I could see out the front door and whatever. But, um, you know, this person came to the house and was like, what are you doing? Why are you doing the demo yourself? You could literally pay someone like a hundred bucks a day to do this. This is stupid. And I'm like, well, because I thought I could do it and it wouldn't anyway. So, uh, but the person grabbed someone literally off the street that I knew nothing about. I had no idea like what kind of drugs they had done. I had no idea 
anything about this person. They literally grabbed them off the street and brought them in the house to start like sawing stuff away, which freaked me out because the person like I think legitimately was like high in the house. And I'm like, you're we're giving this person power tools now and in and, and I, I don't have any liability coverage right now. And so, you know, all these warning signs came to me because I'm like, um, you know, I'm someone that doesn't cut corners um, naturally. And so I'm sitting there learning from somebody else that does this a lot that um, this is okay, you know? So I pretty much, you know, let the guy do a little bit of work and then I said, okay, we're done for the day. And then had him leave and then kind of went back to the drawing board to think about uh, what's, what's going on here. And so I ended up going, you know what, I can't do it this way. I need a general contractor. The house is also, you know, over 40 minutes away from my house. And so I need someone on the site that can be there to speak Spanish to the guys that knows their families, that um, keeps them on the site when they need to be there, uh, on and on and on. So uh, I hired somebody. And again, this was a person that was a recommendation by this person that brought this random person into this house that I was, I bought and was working on. And so warning sign number one, warning sign number two, um, this person I had asked, have you personally used this person on any of your flips or any of your jobs? And he said, yes, but I, again, was too green at the time to know what more questions I should have asked. So at the time it was, okay, well, what did he do? Did he do a bathroom and that's it? Or did he do a whole freaking house? Because I'm giving this guy a whole house, like literally everything, roof, plumbing, insulation, foundation. I mean, everything, cabinets. Um, and, um, I didn't ask those questions. So this person was just assumed to have been used by someone who does a lot of flips before, but also this person never normally hires a GC. They normally subcontract everything. And then because they live in the community, he just rolls around his car all day, stopping by each job site, giving them Gatorade and stuff and checking up on them. Uh, mm -hmm. Again, I don't live up there. And so that was not going to work for me. So it wasn't, wasn't a good fit. Anyway, so I ended up getting into a contract with this person. And again, lesson number three, I'm a real estate agent and broker. And now, so I understand Texas promulgated contracts. So there are these forms that are set up uh, to where basically it sets out most of the legal jargon. And then there's a few areas that you can add in changes like the purchase price, like certain things that are not legal adjustments because I'm not a lawyer, so I can't interpret it any, any kind of legal language. So um, I wasn't using any promulgated forms. And so I also wasn't using a lawyer. So that's another problem. So I started the LLC up correctly. So it was filed with the state, the LLC owned the house. So at least that protected me financially. That was the one thing I think I did right in that situation. So if any of the liability came back on all this crazy crap, it would have been on the house and not my personal finances. So at least let's, that was good. But uh, hold, hold, hold up for just a second here. Um, so this, uh, it's, there's, there's a lot of red flags going on at this point. Uh, and uh, let me ask, was, was this your first flip or? Yep. First and last. First and last. <laughs> okay. Um, you know, you said, uh, I, I just want to go back because you, you've, you've given a mountain of information here and it's, it's a compelling story, but let's unpack this a little bit. Uh, going back to the beginning here, uh, you said, well, I'm using my own cash and so I don't have to worry about, uh, it, you know, upsetting anyone else and, uh, you know, losing their money and that sort of thing. And I actually, actually hear that a lot. Uh, I, I work with multifamily investors and, and one of the first things that they say typically is uh, I want to use my own money for this deal because if I mess up, then it's contained and it's my mistake and it's all in my own money, right? Is that kind of, kind of what your mindset was at the time? Yeah, I mean, at the time I wanted to get started. And mm -hmm. so that was one, the only way I knew how to do it because people are not going to give me their money with no track record. Yeah. Um, but um, yeah, I just, I, yeah, I, th I thought that, you know, if I do fail at this, it's, it's on me. And right. It was a small project. So, and so uh, you just, you sparked a thought in me when you were saying that, and I, I wanted to get your opinion on this. Uh, whenever I hear that, because I hear that quite a bit, uh, my, my response is typically, I, I give you permission to treat your money as if it was somebody else's. Because what, what tends to happen is <clears throat> we, we look at our money and like, oh, well, it's my money if I lose it, whatever. And then we take our money and we go into kind of crazier situations than we would do with other people's money. Uh, and 
and I, and I get that comment so much. I, that's why I kind of say, well, why don't you just treat your money like it was somebody else's money and maybe you can make more conservative decisions. But what, do you, what do you think about that? What do you think about that kind of frame of mind? And I'm just curious because it feels like it applies to, to your situation here a little bit. Um, I think that you're right. I think if I would have thought of it as somebody else's money, I would have been a little bit more scared. And don't get me wrong, I was scared. But um, again, my foolproof system is finding someone who's done what I want to do and been very successful at it and follow their lead, essentially, and ask them questions and make sure that, you know, they're guiding me. But again, at this time, I didn't understand how to do the really annoying detailed stuff to really dig in and get proof of what I needed to know. So, um, yeah, I, again, I think that in this smaller situation, controlled situation, using my money, however I pleased, I was making mistakes. I knew I was going to make mistakes, right? But I knew in this time I was going to make mistakes on my money. So I think the smarter thing would have been to not be so selfish and to partner with somebody else who I knew people that had gotten their end product. So for example, in big RIA, um, okay, that guy does a ton of new bills. That guy does a ton of flips. That guy does whatever he does. And I have either bought a product from him or I have clients that have bought product from him and or her and this is what they got, you know, or this is what it resold at or and this is what it resells at consistently because they do a uh, consistent uh, quality job. So, you know, again, not knowing that the end thing, but I could have partnered with that person financially and maybe gone, okay, I'm going to make, you know, 20, 30% profit um, and split it in half just to learn my first time, you know, yeah. get over it, suck it up. You don't need the profit. It's more about doing it right and learning the system correctly the first time to, to expand. So I think if I would have done it that way, vetted the person a little bit more deeply, um, I would have had a totally different experience. Yeah, understood. Uh, and so, so kind of coming back to the story here. Or with our money, if there were two of us, you know? <laughs> right. Yeah. Agreed. So just kind of coming back to the story, um, you know, so, so many red flags coming up. Uh, this is not going anywhere near the way you expected. Uh, at what point do we reach the black flag, which is kind of the point of no return? Like, you know, this deal is dead and it's not going any further. Take, take me going. to that moment. It kept going. So um, I saw it through all the way to the end. So um, the next thing I was going to say was about the contract part of it. You know, I'm used to promulgated forms and basically I left it up to the professional the general contractor who had a company that had worked for several people supposedly and for them to drop a contract for me to review that contract and then for me to sign okay here's what we're working on here's when the estimated data delivery is here's what we're going to spend and I did you know a, a, adjust or I forget what it's called but put a margin in there if you will you know for error and, and say okay my budget is you know it's actually 20k or it was 10 15k um it was higher at the time, but I didn't tell them that, you know, I was like, we're actually going to be here just in case stuff happened because I've been told by everybody that it does. So, um, so we did that. But anyway, as we go along, I've learned through different hard money lenders and other people that they have a system for the re like the way that they lend for a reason. So like wildcat lending and civic financial and a couple of others, I just went to some other educational events and uh, I figured that again, because I was, not partnered financially, but I was, I had a role model of someone in that community that had done a lot. I thought that they knew it all, you know, and I'm going to all these events and learning all these ways to do things. I'm going, whoa, 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 whoa. Like, yeah, I should have done this, this, this. And it was already too late. You know, I had already gone with them, signed the deal. And uh, at that point I go, okay, so now moving forward, I should have done an itemized um, turnkey contract where basically everything is in one bid. So um, all of the parts, literally like Wildcat Lending has a spreadsheet where it's like how many doorknobs and how many door stoppers and how many faucets and how many every stupid little detail. And I'm low D, I'm a low detailed person. So that would have been something that my general contractor should have been taken care of. But again, it's a, it's a conversation you have to have as the uh, principal or operator, you know, with them and tell them what to do. Otherwise they're not going to do it. Uh, but honestly, a true, a true professional, like I've been able to work with some of my girlfriends since, and that's what they do for a living is they, they flip houses. They take care of their clients. They do the complete opposite. And I find females are really good at that actually, uh, being able to do sort of like a consultation and then being able to break it all down and 
do all of the little stupid details for them and say, here's, here's what it'll cost. Um, worst case, let's start there, you know? Um, so anyway, that contract, so next time I would have written it up myself, I would have done itemized everything turnkey, meaning, um, you have labor and then all the parts cost uh, for each individual area of the house, all broken down, like really meticulously and then delivery or expectation uh, or expected data delivery for each thing and build into your contract. Okay. If you're late a day, it's a hundred dollars out of your total overall, um, paycheck. And then if it's early a day, same thing, you know, I'll give you a hundred dollar bonus or whatever, but you know, we need to meet these delivery timelines. So that was another thing. There were no delivery timelines in there. And so that became a huge headache for me. Um, having to be up there every week to be like, why are there three guys on my job? There's a plumber that's doing something right now. There needs to be one guy in here right now. I'm not paying three people. And so then I just kind of had to just turn into kind of a jerk. And, um, I was being too nice and too, These were professionals, you know, that did it before for another contra or another uh, flipper, you know, but uh, anyway, not. So um, then I had to really dig my teeth in and say, hey, look, uh, -uh. like this is what we're going to do moving forward. And I actually had to have my girlfriend who flips a ton of houses every month. Uh, she came with me and she basically was like, look, at this point, they know you're inexperienced. They know that you don't know what's up. <laughs> So what we're going to do is I'm going to come there. They don't know who has the loan. They have no idea who has the actual, you know, pockets full in this situation. So we're going to go there. I'm going to go with you. You're going to call me the big boss biatch. And I'm going to come in there and say, you work for my company. And I'm going to tell them, this is not okay. This is not okay. This is what's happening. We're writing a new contract. No one gets paid until this gets done on and on and on. And, and he's like, she's like, stop giving a crap when someone says mom's dying or this, that, and the other, or they want to get paid every Friday, but things are not finished. I don't care. You don't need your, your party money, you know? So, um, I really had to, to grow some thick skin and stop calling the person that got me into the process project to, to begin with or not got me into it, but like started, um, kind of mentoring me, if you will. I, I just kind of had to separate there and say, you know what, I'm going to go find some other professionals that really have their shit together. Pardon my French. that really have their stuff together and then ask them for advice. So I ended up, uh, bringing another investor into that, uh, community with me and he was started to flip houses, um, all around kind of where I was doing mine and he would come over and help me, you know, do things the right way or tell me this needs to be this much of an edge here. Or this needs to things that honestly, the contractor's job, they should have been, they should have been knowledgeable enough to know all this stuff. But, uh, but he really helped me and, and Claire too, to kind of dig me out of that situation. So, um, anyway, and, I, and what was the, uh, so it, it sounds like you, you kind of got into a, a, a bind and then you, you brought in some reinforcements and you were to kind of get out of that bind. Uh, when, what was the ultimate result of this flip? Uh, did you make money on it? Did you lose money on it? Uh, you know, what, what ended up happening at the end? What, what, sorry, I couldn't hear that last part. I uh, apologize, but we may have some sort of connection issue here. Uh, what ended up happening, you know, at the end of this flip with, with all these problems and then kind of bringing in the reinforcements, what was the end result? So to be completely transparent and honest, what ended up happening was um, the project took so freaking long. I mean, in my head, it should have taken three to four months to get it done. I think we were at month like, closer to eight uh, whenever it was finished enough for someone to live in it, for it to get all its green tags passed, you know, and list it. And so I, I listed the house and uh, whenever I listed it, I knew that here's where we need to sell it at and the market will realize and here's, um, here's where we're at or whatever. I forgot the, the actual price and where we ended up at or whatever, but there was a certain margin of I'm going to make no money or I'm still going to make money. So what happened was I listed it at that price, brought it down, like after letting it sit for a while, brought it down once and it didn't move. So because it was at a certain time of the year where it's after summer now, no one's moving anymore. And um, just looking at the absorption rate in the community, now I brought in that other guy that he's doing really good quality flips, not far from mine. So I ended up turning it into a long-term hold. Um, I had a guy that um, when I had it for sale that came up to me and he said, are you renting it? And I said, no, it's for sale. Uh, we could do a seller back financing or I could do a wrap mortgage for you if you want to, but he just wasn't ready to do it. He just moved in from another state. And uh, basically he goes, but my company, I mean, they'll pay the insurance on it. They'll pay for the, the pet deposit. They'll pay for the, the month's rent. And so I basically said, okay, well, would you pay this for rent, which was higher than, um, 
higher than if I did sell her back carry or any, anyway, but, uh, so he ended up renting it and he's, um, in it now. And, um, so I'll teach you more lessons. So he's in it now. He's a great renter. Honestly, I got really lucky with him. Um, he wants to be there for at least two years. He said, um, though at the end of year one, it will be month to month. And so I've said, let's have a conversation then about, you know, instead of wasting money, putting some down and then, you know, doing seller back carry or at least putting some towards, you know, monthly towards your, um, your mortgage and whatnot. So he goes, okay, cool. But, um, in that situation, so the loan on the flip was a, a commercial loan. It was not a residential loan. So it was a commercial loan meant to get in and out of it and flip it. Right. Mm -hmm. Um, the commercial loan is a higher interest rate, almost double uh, of what's available out there for like a 30 year fixed mortgage right now. And for me at the time, because of my income and several other things, it was the only thing I could, I could use, you know, to, to do it. So it doesn't run out till 2023, but I just know the interest is ridiculous. So let's just cash out refi or at least refinance to a better longer term fixed, uh, lower interest rate loan. Um, so, uh, I attempted to do that the last couple of months, my credit's good. Um, my cash reserves are good on and on and on, but because of the way that my accountant and I structured my taxes the prior year, we had bought the house, the flip using like having enough uh, DTI or debt to income ratio to do it. Um, though we ended up going commercial anyway. But then the next year, while I was doing all this mess, we did not. We ended up doing it to where basically I took losses in two of my businesses uh, because at that time I had a brokerage that I had started and plus we had this flip house business as well um, that basically were being built that year. And so you spend more than you make, right? So at a loss, there is no debt to income. There is no income, you know? So because of that, I didn't show enough income to have an under 45% guy able to qualify to refinance the house. So I'm like, Oh my God. So what we're doing now is I've had a conversation with my accountants, um, in the multifamily space and personal and I said, all right, here's what we need to show. And here's my goal for Q1 or actually like probably January, February, as soon as possible. Um, to, well, when they're filed, so February or, or so, but, um, we need to get this done ASAP because I need to, um, refinance the house and put it on a long, long-term fixed loan. Um, anyway, so, lesson after lesson after lesson. But, um, biggest lesson I think is, uh, being able to vet your uh, people that are, you're getting advice from extremely well. Yeah. Understood. <clears throat> There's a, a comment that we like to reference, uh, from one of our earliest podcasts uh, with a, a gentleman named Jay Massey. And, uh, we've, we've kind of, uh, we couldn't remember exactly what it was. So we've kind of you know, it's, it's turned into lots of different versions, but I went back and listened to the episode. Uh, and the, the biggest nugget of wisdom that we got from Jay is he said, you just paid full price for that lesson. Yep. Work it and apply it, you know, don't walk away and do something else. And so yep. this is a situation where you paid full price for that lesson and you're going to carry that with you for the rest of time. And, and the biggest lesson here right now for you, at least it sounds like is don't flip houses. Right. Yeah. <laughs> well, for me, um, now I feel more comfortable in the multifamily space because <laughs> it's smaller. So there aren't a lot of like, I'm just going to screw you over this one time and never work with you again, mm -hmm. kind of people because now you have these large properties and they really care the companies do really care about the reputation. They really care about doing business long-term. Um, me as a person, I'm in things for the long game. So flipping houses also, when I really thought about it, I go, okay, I learned all these lessons and I can do this again. But I know that based on the impact I can make financially and the impact that I can make as far as giving space to other people and whatnot, I mean, I'm only making a small budge forward with each house. You know, it's going to take me a decade to make the kind of difference I can in multifamily. So uh, that's why for me, after meeting a few people that had done a really, really, really good, tremendous job over the last 10 years and plus longer um, flipping multifamily, that that was the place I needed to be in. Yeah, very well. Well, speaking of lessons here, we're going to move on to the next section of our show here called Failing Forward. And uh, if you could mute your notifications, that would be great. It'll mute uh, you. Uh, so what we're going to do here is we're going to ask you a series of five questions, and then you can just answer 
each one briefly in a sentence or two. Okay, you ready? Good to go? Okay. Uh, bottom line, why did this failure experience happen to you? Why did it happen to me? Because it was meant to happen to me. <laughs> Honestly, um, I really think that, so, so I knew people that it went well for them. For example, their first flip or whatever. Um, you know, what, it doesn't matter what type of job they came from. I know people that were uh, engineers at Lockheed that had a flip go completely crap on them, you know, and there's someone that's super, um, super numbers oriented, super detail oriented, very process, you know, so like if people aren't checking the boxes and following the processes that they would not put up with it, um, things didn't go well for them either. But I think that um, making the impact that I need to make on the world, it, needed to happen faster and I needed to stop piddling around with little things and go bigger and get my name out there. Um, so I think that it happened to me because it needed to. Okay. Yeah. Fair enough. Uh, and you know, sometimes the, the universe puts those lessons, those things in front of us uh, so that we can have the experience and sometimes yeah. we squirm a little bit, but we learn from that. So, so many lessons that you've gained from this, uh, but if you had to pick one, what is the single most important lesson that you learned from this experience? Any, any resource that you're trusting with your financial future, you need to vet the crap out of that. So for me, whether it's partners, whether it's, you know, mentors, whether it's anybody. I like to, I meet a lot of people. I really do, but I'd like to ask around, you know, multiple, multiple people. Have you done deals with this person? How did it end up? What happened? Um, how many deals have they flipped? How many deals have you guys done together? Because you can also look these things up. You know, when you take, taking some time to not be so hasty to make money or to, um, I'm very impatient, you know, basically taking the time to vet people that you're going to listen from, listen to and take financial advice from. Uh, that's like the most important thing. I mean, honestly. And along those lines, how, how do you protect yourself from failing in this way again? So now when it comes to somebody that, so, so part of it was a personal transition where I needed to learn to trust my gut. Um, I always leaned on my intelligence and my head to, to make decisions for me. And while that's cool and, you know, I can get multiple degrees and read lots of books and this, that, and the other, especially as a female, we really have the ability to trust our gut and to kind of know what's up. Like, you know, to, to really see when someone's got flies swarming above their head. I mean, there must be some poo underneath, you know what I mean? Like that's, <laughs> that's a gut feeling. And so I had to learn to, to trust, that and to listen to it. And when something cringes or when something walk away, walk away, don't even, don't second guess yourself. Don't bother, move on, you know, and the people that you don't get that with, then spend a little bit of time kind of researching them. So asking around in the multifamily community, it's a very small community. When people are doing bad deals, everybody knows about it. They disappear on and on. So I like that as well. I can be a little bit more just myself because I don't have to press anyone. You just um, either do good deals or you don't, you know, but um, I have a skip tracer also in Nigeria. Every partner, every business partner, every um, every operator I want to passively invest with, every uh, coworker um, that I take on or hire, I do a background check, a criminal background check and a financial background check, just like you would like with a renter that you're taking on at your property. And it's very important to know those things. And you want to know if someone has had a bankruptcy, if they're a felon. That was something going back to the first person I was listening to advice from. They were a several time felon um, and somebody that is a felon. There's, there's nothing wrong with that per se. I'm someone who's very open-minded, but the problem with it is that they're, so I love culture index. It's a human analytics test that I also use on all those people I mentioned before, plus the background checks and whatnot. It really shows you how that person's brain operates in what space, you know, are they more autonomous, analytical, creative, uh, when it comes to rules, where do they follow along the spectrum? What's their norm? And you can kind of see where that all, and it's just, it's so, so accurate. So this person, you would see their, uh, basically the dot, if you will, that would show their ability to follow rules was way far left 
way negative south of the x-axis. And so that's somebody that does not believe that rules apply to them ever. Not now, not in the future, not in the past, never. So that's something that you'll commonly see um, on a to be felons uh, culture index test or someone that already was. And so it's just people don't change. They they do the right things moving forward, but they still cut corners. They still um, don't do things like by the book, kind of like I want to. So um, being able to get your people, I mean, that's what I do now for everybody. And, you know, I hate to say it, but, you know, if there is something off, like, you know, their home address or you ask them their home address and it's not the same on there, I'll ask more questions. And again, if they're uncomfortable answering those questions, that's another huge red flag. If someone like me, if you ask me, why is your exit cap rate like this? The market's going to bear this. Why do you feel the need to do this? Or, you know, you guys are litigating against this tax problem here. Why is it, you know, I'll answer their questions. And if I don't know, I don't know, but I'm not going to make up some BS answer. And you can really tell, especially face to face with somebody, if they're BSing you and Again, walk away. I mean, yeah. it's it's too much pain, especially for me when I'm doing things with other people's funds to, to even bother with it. Agreed. You know, one of the most intelligent responses that, that you can give, however contrary this may feel, is I don't know. Yeah. Um, because it, you're, you're, you're admitting that you are not perfect and uh, it takes somebody pretty intelligent to do that. The other, the other thing, the other quotable I, I got from that is, if there's flies swarming around the head, there's probably some poo underneath. I love that. That's a nice way to say it. Yeah, that's a very Texas. I'm gonna, yeah, yeah, I'm gonna, <laughs> I'm gonna make see if we can make that the uh, the quote of your episode. We'll we'll plaster that all across spo- social media with your face on it. Yeah, use the poo emoji. <laughs> the poo emoji. That's yeah. Funny. <laughs> Excellent. And so, uh, Kaylee, you've you've kind of surrounded yourself with a. Uh, a network. Obviously, this came from a mentor, and it was kind of a you know a situation where where it didn't turn out so well. But who do you ultimately turn to when you need help now? When I need help now, um, I've got four people. So each of the people has different types of experience. You know, one is involved in commercial real estate in general, so hotels, mixed use resorts. Um, what is it, uh, fast food chains, putting them into certain classes of areas, but that person's been doing it for 40 years. So that's somebody that's like, look, quit reading your damn books and call me. Like I've done it. You know, they've done two apartments and it's not really like their thing, but in, in a general business perspective in uh, real estate and commercial real estate, that's a good person to ask. Now, my direct mentor, Alex, um, he is specifically in the multifamily space. That's what he lives and breathes every single day. So he's the person that taught me everything, how to underwrite. He taught me how to order supplies, where we order them from, how, how to reprice things, how to hire the right third-party management company, what questions to ask them. I mean, on and on and on. He taught me everything. And so that's somebody who he's also very um, wise and grounded in his day-to-day practice. He's someone that... Um, He's a business owner, but at the same time, he understands that people are at the core of why everything happens. And so he's very much someone that, not just for advice, he's also someone that when I think I can't do something, he's like, you know, when you have that little guy in your head that's like, you're not smart enough, you're not pretty enough, you're not, you know, experienced enough, whatever, call me, I will squish that person because you can do it, you know? Mm-hmm. So that's those two guys. And then I have someone who's involved with Culture Index. That's someone that's like a, a business mentor, if you will. So that person works with Fortune 500 companies across the United States and their CEOs. And so um, he sees me as an up and coming young CEO and just kind of guides me as far as some things to watch out for. And in a lot of it, it's reinforcing my gut feelings of what I should do, like not cutting corners, just do the right thing putting people first, things like that, but it's good to have that reinforcement. So, you know, three or four people. Okay, great. And, uh, and finally, what advice would you give to someone who finds himself in a similar situation, uh, such as they're, they're trying to invest in a flip and, uh, and they're surrounded by felons and, uh, you know, people that are working on the job site that are high and, and nothing's going right. What advice would you give to somebody in that situation? Um, I would say, tell everybody to leave the job site for a week. Say, we're shutting it down. I know, you know, like Kaylee, I'm impatient. So I wanted to get going, get going, but just stop. Just literally pump the brakes, go back home. And for example, the Dallas real estate investment group, there's always a local RIA 
um, and it's a very tight knit community. And so that would be a good place to turn to ask a, a large group of people. All right, I'm trying to flip a house who in this group has flipped at least 10 to 20 houses last year and does good quality work. And they would probably all point you to the same person and then go talk to that person. Here's what I'm running into. Here's what I want to do. Yada, yada. And honestly, as long as you are nice and find a way to take this person to lunch or give them something of value, it doesn't have to be huge. For me, it was just this person didn't want to see a fellow investor screwed over by people that were, I mean, taking advantage. Um, so he ended up just being like, just call me anytime, you know, and that is what I do. So if you need to walk across the street or something, I'm starting to flip houses over there as well. Um, I'm happy to help. So that if that would have happened way early on when I was doing the foundation, that would have made all the difference in the world. Um, but anyway, so I had to backtrack and spend a lot. And now we're at the point where I'm going to sit on it and let it appreciate. And then when the market's right, get rid of it. So. Okay. Very good. So uh, lots of, uh, lots of golden lessons to take from this experience. And so tell us a little bit about uh, what you're doing now and uh, how, how people can reach out to you and what, what kind of uh, value you're putting into the world. So now as the apartment queen, my why, as we discussed earlier, way earlier in the podcast is to be able to help create independence through commercial real estate. So I feel like it's a, it's a good old boys network right now, especially in the South. And so there aren't enough females that are kick butt brokers. You know, I don't, I've called several of them, but they're either new or they just focus on their billion dollar clients, you know? And so there's a lot of growth minded people in, um, other brokerages like Marcus and Millichap, et cetera, that have reached out to me, given me good deals. And, you know, obviously now that I'm starting to grow, we're all growing together. And, um, you know, that, that's, that's my why is to have more females that do that in the commercial real estate space, plus more female principals. So moving forward, you know, I've got a couple deals right now. I'm a key principal partnered with a couple other females. I want to change it to where I have more options where there's more women doing it. Um, and, and getting out there about it. Um, what was the other question? Uh, so uh, normally uh, when someone comes on our podcast, they have a uh, something that they would like to just kind of put out there to the audience and ways that they can connect with you and that sort of thing. And so uh, what would be, you know, our audience is made up of investors and entrepreneurs, and people who are actively involved in real estate or want to be um, you know, what kinds of resources can you point them to or, or who would be a good person to kind of engage with you in that, in that sense? Sure. So right now in my trajectory of growth, we're at 500 doors assets under management with several different deals, uh, five different deals. And if you are curious about changing your trajectory from maybe working a nine to five as an engineer, uh, you want to be able to have more freedom of time or freedom to follow your why, uh, you can reach out to me at admin at the apartment queen.com. And we can teach you kind of what we have done in the past and how we've been able to help other people create independence through, through real estate. And, um, I don't, and if, you know, if you are wanting to start doing active um, deals in commercial real estate, um, I'm willing to partner with people as well. So um, if you're really, really growth minded and you want to find out about, you know, what value you can bring to our team to be able to go do a deal. I mean, obviously I don't, I don't do any educational courses. I don't do any, I get asked for consulting fees to do this and that all the time. I, I don't do that. If you want to bring something to the table, go in a deal together. I will teach you everything that we do and guess what? It's a win-win. So, uh, anyone would be able to, um, get, uh, more, more, more net worth, more liquidity, um, more experience to be able to maybe go out on their own, uh, later and do a deal, but, uh, you got to start somewhere. So, um, yeah, admin at the apartment com and I am Kaylee McMahon. Very good. Uh, one more time. That's admin at theapartmentqueen.com. And so, uh, Kaylee, let me ask you this. Does uh, someone who reaches out to you, do they, do they need to have any re uh, experience in real estate or will you take people that are brand new? Um, it really depends. So it's more kind of going back to that personality test, honestly, like I, I would have them take that the first thing because, you know, I've seen someone recently that I looked at hers and her personality type is just slow. 
like somebody that is slow and methodical and and I've seen that a little bit in our exchanges too. Good person, don't get me wrong, but just somebody that would drive me nuts as a partner because I need something <laughs> that we can parlay off each other. I can go, you go do this, I go do that, you go do this, you know. Um, one of my partners that was an awesome match for me, if someone is like this, is she's very data oriented. She is very if you if I give her a spreadsheet of this is what we did. Here's what we did after that. Here's the end result. And I just give her answers like that. She is good to go. Like easy peasy. And her, her thing that she loves is she's like the safety officer. So anything that has to do with making sure we're on code compliance, making sure that, you know, anything that needs to be registered with the county is or whatever like that, just quadruple checking to make sure that we have permits pulled, whatever, you know, she wants to make sure that uh, the project is all, all legal and, and is all good. Um, and I'm, so we're, we're a good team. So somebody that, um, would be a good compliment to me, um, high detail oriented, very motivated, self, self-driven, and hopefully has an idea of their why that would be a good, um, a good new person or someone that's been a business owner that's bought and sold companies and wants to get into real estate. That would be a great person because they're hyper intelligent and they know how to run systems. And that's, what's so important too. Okay, excellent. So uh, one more time, the website is theapartmentqueen.com with Kaylee McMahon. And you can reach her directly via email, admin at theapartmentqueen.com. Thank you so much, Kaylee, for being on here. We're going to wrap for today. Uh, appreciate you sharing your story. And uh, we hope this has been a, a liberating experience just to get it off of your chest and, and move on and, and share those lessons with yeah. the world here. <laughs> So, uh, hey, to our lis uh, listeners, thank you very much for joining us. If this story has had an impact on you, the best way that you can show your appreciation to us is to tell a friend about How to Lose Money. HowToLoseMoney.com has all of our previous episodes. And, uh, you know, the, we don't do any kind of advertising or marketing, so it's, it's best to just kind of get word of mouth out there and, and share it as we continue to grow. By the way, we are publishing a book called How to Lose Money. That should be out sometime in 2020 towards the end. And so you can relive all of the amazing failure stories of uh, days gone by. Until next time, remember this, failure is a fact of life. Whether or not it defines you is a personal choice. Bye, everybody.